Happy Friday, everybody. Happy cocktail night. Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. I'm Deanna. Let me fix my format here. We got some stuff going on. You can't imagine how crazy this screen looks right now. There we go. Cheers, my dears. I'm getting my pre-made little cocktail into my super sophisticated cup so we can start a very nice tribute episode to Judy Carter. So I've been waiting to do this episode. I'm going to do my cheers, my dears, in just a minute. I've been waiting to do this episode for a couple of weeks because I have had all along her amazing, uh, really groundbreaking book on hooking animals, everything, scales, fur, feathers, everything. <laughs> um, and I couldn't find it. It's hard to believe, right? But uh, I ordered another one, and it took a while, but it got here. So we are going to pay a tribute tonight to Judy Carter, whose work was legendary. Um, and I have a beautiful tribute. Uh, Betty sent me some beautiful stuff that I can read and share as well. So we will do that. But in the meantime, let's get going. I've got a light shining right here where the sun has been hitting all that great hair dye, right? And that's one of the joys of summer. Happy Friday night. Cheers, my dears. Let's see who's here. Carol, good to see you. Cheers. Oh, I'm missing some good conversation here. So far, so good. Um, Doreen, happy Friday, Saturday. Cheers. I got to do two sips now because that was two cheers. Hi, Carol. Cheers. You gave me the number three. I don't always make it to cocktail time, so I'm happy to be here. Well, I'm happy you're there too. Judy Carter's hooking was phenomenal. I'm only on number two. We're, we're, you're just not going to believe this book tonight. We're going to spend some time really looking at how amazing uh, of a teacher she was, just with a book, right? Not even in person also, because Betty gives a great firsthand account of working with her as a teacher, having her um, kind of um, help with human hair, which is so similar, obviously, to fur or animal hair. It's a great account, but uh, cheers, my dears. Ah, I don't even know what that is. My word. Teresa, happy Friday night. Cheers, April. Cheers. Glad to be with you tonight, too. Glad to be with everybody. Robin, three wine glasses. Ooh, that looks exciting, doesn't it? Three little red. I, I love things in multiples, particularly wine. Barbara, hello. Good to see you. Barbara was so good in class the other night. She's always so focused and intense when we do our design classes together. And I hope you're all working on your chairs. I started my Van Gogh chair today. Um, I started doing a video. Punch is such a big thing right now, and I'm punching the chair. So I've got it I've got it across the room, but it's on one of Amy Oxford's fantastic big frames. And I started doing a video. Um, Crystal, you inspired me with the speeding it up thing. I only ever did that once, and it, I felt like it was a pig's breakfast. But yours are excellent, so I have hope. I want to show doing the whole Van Gogh thing, because um, it should be a really nice one to punch with all the swirls, if you remember. To be continued, Tara, good to see you. I see the little clicking glasses. Cheers and happy Friday night. Mmm. Dave in Toronto, you've got your ice cold beer and popcorn with real butter on it. Isn't that the thing, really? You know, it's so funny that you say that. I'm going to start, right? I'm going to start. Um, I was over in Mystic the other day, not at the Mystic Seaport, which is like a recreation village, beautiful sort of uh, golden age of whaling village in Connecticut, Mystic, Connecticut, of Mystic Pizza, right? But uh, we were in the other area. They have this little shopping area set up that is something like, you know, it's supposed to look like colonial sort of era, settlement era houses, but there's little shops in them and there's a little duck pond and lots of little animals running around, squirrels and things. It's very green. It's really lovely. For, for a shopping area, it's really, really lovely. And we went over there and there's a movie theater over there that I used to stop in every week when I was a tour guide because the bus stopped overnight in Mystic. And I would set everybody up. We'd go to Mystic Pizza, pick up the pizzas on the bus to go. Um, get back, I'd set up the video, which was like a DVD, right, in the common room of the hotel, Mystic Pizza, and I'd get everybody going, and then I would take off across the street to the movie theater because that movie theater had the tubs of popcorn where they would put a little bit of popcorn, squirt butter on top, a little bit more popcorn, squirt more butter, all the way to the top, layer cake. I mean, it was a layer cake of butter and pop. It was the best. And then I would come back to my room and have some wine and popcorn because it's a tour guide needs some time off at the end of the day, right? But I love thinking about that. There is a right and a wrong way, right, Dave? There's no question about that. 
Kirsten, happy Friday. Kirsten was helping me make a decision about whether I wanted to stay in the studio tonight or um, head back out home, which I really didn't want to do. Um, and I stayed in the studio because there is a hurricane on the way here. I guess Henri is knocking on our door and it's not supposed to be tonight. It's supposed to be tomorrow. Just lots of rain tonight. So I hope that you're safe and I hope that you have plans to be safe if you are in the line of Henri. Um, we'll see what happens. Knock on wood. Say a little prayer and all that, right, for everybody that's in the line of fire. Um, Donna, um, good to see you. I think I just sent something out to you. Ooh, what did you find? Bring it over here. Oh, 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 oh. Jay was over at Goodwill and he brought me he brought me this. You know, we have the Goodwill by the pound. It's Very nice. Piece. Thank you. It's a giant piece. Look at that. So how much do you think that cost? Four dollars. Really? Yeah. God, it's gotta be maybe four yards, five yards. Look at that. Yeah. How gorgeous is that? You see that little bit of brown in there? Oh, that is nice. Didn't have any um Mods on it, right? And then they saw. All right, we'll give it a, give it a good shake just to be yeah, sure. It was, was that Goodwill? They were sleeping though, so. <laughs> you know they have um, it. I, maybe hopefully for you too. Some of the Goodwills go by weight. They're not proper stores. Oh my, that is like the size of, Huge. like it's like a the, the first floor of the house. <laughs> Um, wow. So I hope you have one of those where you are too, because it's nice to be able to shop and find good finds like that. Just raw material. Patricia, good to see you. You have a question on the Van Gogh challenge. Should it be completed? Um, uh, Patricia, we pushed it back to um, November 30th, the last day of November. It was just too soon uh, with all the other projects happening at the same time and just not enough notice. So we pushed it back to the last day of November. I couldn't find where that was wrong. I know, I think you told me it was wrong somewhere on one of the pages, but I couldn't find it. Um, I'm wondering if it's on the Facebook group or on Ribbon Candy Hooking, but it is the last day of November. So, um, you know, and I don't want to worry too much about that. If you're feeling inspired to do it, whether it's big, small, whatever, I really want to make it work with you. I, I bet Barbara feels the same way. It's Barbara's idea, Barbara's challenge. Um, but it'd be great to make them work because I've got some really good conversations with, I'm trying to figure out how many people are bringing them in to kind of choose where would be the best place to exhibit them here. If you, if you are also sending me your rug, it's going to be a lot of fun. The first of many, the first of many, but uh, really fun. Jenny, good to see you. And Karen, good to see you. Hooking and waiting for the hurricane indeed, right? <laughs> Jenny says, happy Friday evening. Headed home to get some moonshine. Yes, yes. At a little still somewhere right on the side of the road. I know, $4. It's crazy, right? What a find. Yeah, it's a beauty, too, with all that red. I'm, I'm going to stop. I don't want to make you too jealous. Hey, maybe I'll put it in a kit, right? Because it was a great bargain. We can probably all share it. Looks like it's going to be very full to hook, too. And then you ordered the Klimt kit. I sent that out, and it is beautiful. Each Klimt kit is very different. So I hope that you like what you got. Let me know if you don't. It's typical Klimt co color, so it's like the colors in the pictures, but I put some extra things in because I hadn't made the Klimt kit for a while. I got a bit carried away with doing a few of the extra little balls of different materials, things that glitter and shine and glow, and uh, it's, it's a beautiful kit. I hope that you love it. Cynthia, happy Friday. Happy hour. That's right. And Marty, hello to you. Oh, thank you so much. D tonight, Judy is going to be an amazing inspiration. Wait until you see this book. I know some of you probably have it already. I have to give it. Yep. Patricia, I'm sure that you'll have time to finish it. We'll make it work. We'll figure it out. Give a shout out if you get stuck or need help with anything uh, with this Van Gogh challenge or anything. Just give a shout out or email me anytime at ribboncandyhooking at gmail.com. We can work through any disaster that's going on. It's not a big deal. I'm not going to charge you to get on Zoom with you for a few minutes and work through colors or work through anything if you're having a bit of a um, I don't want to say breakdown. If you're at some kind of a crossroads, that's a bit uh, sketchy and um, and unsettling. We can always talk through stuff like that. So we will get through all of our projects that are coming up for sure. Catherine, good to see you. Yeah. Okay, Barbara, I'm glad you said that. I didn't want to speak for you, but uh, we can make it a movable um, deadline for sure. We'll see how it kind of evolves. Um, because they probably won't be showing realistically until probably January, February. So there's tons of time to play with here, and we will make it work for everybody. There's a lot of places around me uh, who are interested in having um, this little show up, you know, unless it turns into a big show, um, because people are very interested in rug hookers and rug hooking and punching, of course, and also very interested in Van Gogh, of course, because of the moving exhibit. Um, please, Jay just reminded me, like, share, comment, all the things you can do to keep these videos going. Uh, we have so much fun on Coffee Time Monday to Wednesdays. 
uh, Friday night cocktail time. And on Thursdays, as soon as summer's over, I will get back into doing our weekly Zoom so we can fool around, chat, have fun, ask questions, get answers, all of those things. It's just been a bit of a wild summer so far with the kids and all that stuff. So one more sip. Ah, all right. So, oh my gosh, I almost forgot. So last night, you know how I was going to hook? I have the main class coming up. Not this weekend, because this weekend for local people, I will see you at Whispering Hill, the raw cooking store in Woodstock, Connecticut, and I can't wait. It's just for fun. Remember, it's $5, and Donna does cash and checks. So if you're going to do some shopping with her, it is the best new old stock store that I've ever seen. I don't mean just of raw cooking. I mean of anything, right? It's like a dream. Do you ever have that dream? shouldn't even say this out loud, that it's like not a zombie movie, but you're in a 1980s mall and like Spencer's Gifts is still there and the weather vane is still there and stuff like that. I have that dream a lot. Like I'm walking through with my friends with my big gold earrings, you know, and those kind of like import shirts with paisleys on them. And yeah, so uh, this is like that, except everything in the store is rug hooking. Draws and draws like an old apothecary. I think that's why I dream of it because it has undertones of like past lives and all that kind of thing drawers that pull out that are filled with egg beater, punch needles, and rug hooks, old and new. Tons of wool, old and new. Um, tons of scraps of wool, too, for very inexpensive amounts. So lots of dye. She's got all the pro-chems. Um, she's got a, a lot. She's got a lot in all of the books you could ever want. Certainly every book I have ever spoken about on Coffee Time, she's got there for a very good price. So if you are not able to come and you want to shout out to me or send an email saying, can you see if she has this for me? do that because you know I can be like a little um, carrier pigeon too. I don't mind doing that, picking something up and like forwarding it to somebody else. I saw somebody else made a message. I haven't, hasn't come up yet. Oh, it's mom. Fell asleep and just woke up. Oh boy. Oh boy. Well, you know, nothing like a daytime nap, right? Nothing like a daytime nap. So this weekend is done. And then of course, Sunday night, I'm doing the second installment of the, for the people who haven't done it yet, the Maud Lewis class, Designing Like Maud Lewis. That's coming up Sunday night. Next weekend is the class in Maine, where I showed you we're going to be um, punching this design, try to remember, the kind of September, from last September. And then last night, I told you I was going to uh, hook this. This will be the hooking pattern at that class. And I did. I haven't blocked it yet. And, you know, I'm not a super fan. I'm never a super fan of my own stuff. But, you know, it's moose. It's moonlight moose. And I really wanted to do, I, want, I wanted to do something very traditional because this is after a real old antique rug, like middle 19th century rug. I put 2021 on it. You know, I don't know how I feel about that. I hooked the numbers in plaid, which was, I thought, pulling in the two trees that are kind of multi oranges and yellows. It doesn't have enough color for me personally, but I, I wanted to do them by moonlight. So I did a lot of busyness in the background and I did as antlers kind of velvety and multi and snout a little bit of a different color a little bit of a searching eye uh, cranberry colored grass ground you know like the leaves had fallen very stylized you know nothing like Judy Carter's work that we're about to look at but you know this is I think a good example and quite small a nice sized mug rug for autumn and winter of a moose you know making his little browsing uh, journey through the woods at moonlight and um, I think it's very simple thanks Beverly I think it's very simple for beginners and I have all this hand dyed wool that's going into it so those will be the two patterns that are coming up for um, the main class in Kenny Bungport next Saturday at Arundel Gallery uh, Farm Gallery Arundel Gallery I think um, and then I will make the moose pattern available as soon as I sort of stabilize again and uh, finish up with some of these classes so Let's talk about what we're here for tonight uh, besides fun, um, Judy Carter. So, you know, Judy Carter passed a couple of weeks ago and it was all over the um, all of our rug hooking pages, our social media pages on Facebook. Um, this is always very sad when this happens and the word goes around uh, very fluidly and well and people are notified uh, who knew and cared and loved her. Uh, students and um, other people who are working, uh, you know, in the field. Everybody, I think, felt it uh, hugely because she was a huge talent and she had, she really owned um, a very specific area of rug hooking and that is hooking animals. And I don't just mean animals, I mean uh, all the things that go with animals, the fur, the expressions, 
um, like I said, the scales, the all of those textures. I don't know anybody, I can't think of anybody who's ever done that as well. And this really was her forte. This was, as my mother it introduced me to this great expression last night, her pocket garden, right? We all have different pocket gardens that are filled with little things that are super special and dear and our fortes. This certainly was Judy's forte. Um, hey, Lily, good to see you. So, you know, I was very happy to be reacquainted with this book. Now I have two copies if the other one turns up. I, Looking at it again after about a year or two since I got the first one, I was just blown away by the quality uh, of her work, by the the sort of story. The, there are many aspects to this book. Storytelling is one of them, but how-to is very, very strong. And the two run parallel to each other and make for a nice sort of fusion. While you're reading the book, I never met Judy, but while you're reading the book, you have a real impression uh, of how she spoke and how she was as a person, running right alongside this very guided technical information about doing the hardest part of rug hooking, which is like shading realism, right? Faces, whether it's a human or an animal, it's going to be hard. And she covers all aspects of it. So um, let's get started with this. And please interrupt if you would like to interrupt. You know what? I'm going to start with Betty's great messages. She sent me a couple really beautiful messages. Um, when I put the word out, when Judy, the word went around that Judy at first, you know, had passed, I put out the word, please send messages. And, and Betty sent me this one, which I thought uh, was a real tearjerker. It was just beautiful. So let me read you some of that. She forwarded, um, she forwarded an email from the let me get this right because i belong to this group too she says below forwarded um is more about judy carter's life from the wool rights one word wool right um w-o-o-l w-r-i-g-h-t at the chapter right so they are also on facebook if you are on facebook this is a great group to belong to another group like the midwest group these are my favorite groups um, smaller groups, friendly groups that post the most beautiful work that you don't always see across the larger groups. Incidentally, we are the largest group at this point of, in the U.S. Dan Fitzpatrick is much bigger than us in Canada, but we are now the largest group. Isn't that amazing? You all are there doing great things, great work, and, and egging each other on, which I just think is amazing and, and perfect. So the Woolwrights, if you don't know them, check them out. Very fun at the chapter in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So you know there's going to be good rugs coming out of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, right, Lisa? Um, and she says, I thought you and your followers might appreciate it, um, as I do now and when Judy wrote it in March of last year. So this, the uh, interview that I'm about to read you came out in March of 2020. It was a good time for that kind of relief, right? Um, and she said, thanks to Deb Burchin of the Woolwrights for encouraging members to tell their stories. This is so true. I want to get to this, too, on our channel, um, visiting with specific people who are in our group, whether they are famous or not, whether they are an artist with a capital A or not, doesn't make any difference. You're all artists. I want to hear all of the stories of all of you who want to share. And thank goodness Deb started this sort of practice of interviewing members of this chapter of Atha, because for that reason, we have this beautiful interview with Judy that I'm about to read to you because it is very hard to find information about Judy online. Um, but thanks to Betty and thanks to Deb for having conducted this interview, we have this information to look at tonight. So, um, oops, what did I do? Okay, so let's see. So it's actually an interview format. And um, one of the questions asks about Judy's family. And um, <laughs> thanks, Tara. Thank And to you, too. It's our group, right? It's definitely not just me, Kirsten. Kirsten is the main admin these days for sure. Um, so Judy's family, uh, she's, it says, do you have any children or grandchildren? Tell us more. And Judy answered, I have one son who's married and lives in Falls Church, Virginia. I have one grandson who is the best grandson ever. With a smiley face. Uh, and then the next question was, what was your previous occupation? Did you work outside the home or did you work from home? And her answer was, I worked in banking with positions in operational departments, meaning overdrafts, return checks, all those stomach churning things, right, for nine years. Then in branch positions, including assistant manager, manager, regional manager. I worked for what is now Wells Fargo, uh, members First Credit Union and Univest Bank. I took early... Um, retirement, I cut that off, in 2019 in order to spend more time um, teaching and with her family, of course. 
And the next question was, where are you originally from? And she answered, I am from and I have lived in Lancaster County my entire life. I grew up near East Petersburg and lived in Lancaster, East Petersburg, Lidditz, and Willow Street, which is a town. And the next question was, what is something that you have never, uh, that you ha that you have never don't, okay, let's try this again. What is something that you have never, okay, it's a typo, there we go, done that is on your bucket list that you would like to try? And she says, I wanted to do more traveling with my family, but my health issues and now the coronavirus, um, I'm glad and very content to stay at home. Thankfully, we, and she puts in parentheses, husband, son, daughter-in-law, and grandson, took a trip to Nova Scotia in September. So I was able to visit the Rug Hook Museum and Dion Fitzpatrick's studio. Do you have something to share that you think no one or only a few people know about? And she says, my husband and I used to go on motorcycle trips with his friends and also went camping in a tent. Those days are over, with an exclamation point. I also used to make and sell Raggedy Ann and Andy dolls. Interesting, right? What is your favorite hobby or hobbies? And she says, I've been hooking since 1993 and all other hobbies ceased after I started hooking. This art form allows so much creativity, I never grow tired of it. I enjoy all types of hooking, but I found my niche when I started hooking animals. I love seeing them come to life at the end of my hook. What are you working on, she asks. I just finished a number nine cut, a 50 inches by 55 inch project called Faith. Uh, I made it as a motivational piece, a piece for my health journey after my cancer diagnosis. It will be on display at Sauter Village in August. I am ready to start a number four cut Scottish Highland Steer. So that chokes me up a little bit because, um, you know, there is uh, currently a there is currently an exhibit on Judy Carter at Sauter now because, of course, Sauter didn't happen last year with coronavirus. So we know that all of that is there now. If you are there, maybe you're watching from your hotel room. That was a rough one. Uh, number eight, do you have a good thought to share with all your friends? And she answers, I would love to thank them for their friendship, their support, their emails, cards, thoughts, and prayers, particularly this past year. I cannot express how much they helped and how much it has meant to me. And the presentation I did in February at the Guild meeting was so refreshing and healing for me. I could see, hear, and feel the support and care coming to me, and I am forever thankful. So, all right, I'm going to take a sip. That, that's a rough one. <laughs> I hadn't read that first. It's fairly intense. Ah, oh, all right. She sent some beautiful pictures, too, that are probably not in focus on my phone. So I am very, that was rough, but I'm very happy, Betty, that you sent that. It's, uh, it's um, you know, I hadn't read that on the wool rights, and I'm sorry that I missed it, but now we have all heard it and probably choked up a bit. So Betty also sent this uh, great email that's a firsthand account of her interactions with Judy, and I want to share that, too, before I open the book up. She said, um, in 2006, I attended a Sharon Smith workshop in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Now that reminds me, and you too, of course, that you know when Sharon Smith passed, we ran the Sharon Smith episode, and that was a tough one to get through too, uh, but so beautiful. And I am working on a Sharon Smith project, so that is uh, coming up. Uh, Betty, I'll be in touch with you about that, and uh, anybody else who has information on Sharon Smith. It's so hard to let these people go because they are such icons and and such rug hooking royalty, uh, and there's not a lot of us, right? There's, we're not even considered a hobby on Google anymore. They removed us in 2020. There's not enough of us doing it. Uh, so it's just awful to have to let people go. But uh, Betty says she went to a Sharon Smith workshop in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, sponsored by the Conestoga Rug Hooking Guild, and Judy Carter was an attendee. Uh, Betty says, since I live in Virginia, I brought along several unfinished pieces for help. One was of my one-year-old granddaughter. Her hair was just not working. As Sharon and I looked at my pieces, Judy joined us. Judy's sage advice was to hook it just like fur, multiple textures and multiple lengths and colors. Thinking about my granddaughter as an animal did the trick. <laughs> That's funny, Betty. Back home, I easily finished up the mat, satisfied with the results. It's one of my favorites, thanks to Judy. I'm now sad that I never got to show it to her, but I'm even sadder that I did not take the time after the workshop to thank her for her good advice and generosity in helping me a reminder to all of us. That is so true. That is so true. 
Um, and, you know, I'm sure in these situations, Betty, it's just, um, you know, life gets busy, doesn't it? We all get busy. But it's just that overarching um, idea that it's so important to thank people and acknowledge people and recognize people in every situation, at the gas station, at, uh, at a workshop, everywhere. Um, you know, because it, it goes a long way. It costs nothing to be nice to people. But yet being, um, uh, I don't know if you can see this, uh, Kira sent that to me, is, is, it takes a toll on everybody, your health, everybody else around you. It's so important to be kind and to, to say extra words to people. I'm sure, Betty, that she knew that you appreciated immensely the help that uh, she gave you. And let me see if I can open Betty's piece, which is just gorgeous. I'm going to try to open it on my phone. Um, oh, it's a photograph, so obviously that's not going to work. Hang on just a second. Whew. Oh, all right. Got myself going a little bit. Hold on just a second. Jay, I just got myself crying a little bit. Doing uh, doing these um, tribute shows is hard. Uh, it's hard. Let me see if I can pull this up. Please let this be the one. I'm better. You're good. <laughs> got it together. <laughs> Took a minute. I'm going to see if I can find this later because um, I really want to show you the piece that, um, here it is. I really want to show you the piece that Betty sent that Sharon helped with. That's not a very good picture, but you can see that's the little grandchild and how great that hair turned out, thanks to Judy. So, you know, and I agree with Betty's sentiment that, um, you know, thinking of your kids, your grandkids as animals certainly does help, right? But, um, you know, what an incredible artist, right, Patricia? I mean, really. So, you know, this, I am so, you know, I'm probably the wrong person to do this episode because uh, hooking realism is definitely not my thing. I can look at it, I can admire it, I have to say, until I really read this book, like really read it, didn't just flip through the pictures and say, oh, that's nice, oh, that's even nicer. Until I really read the book, I don't think that I really appreciated um, how much goes into creating a, a hooked or punched piece with this level of realism. Um, my style is much more sort of graphic. That's al always what I've liked more. Um, I mean, my moose looks nothing like this lion, does it? Um, I've always liked the primitive style more but this book really bridges that gap she builds a bridge she builds a bridge that wasn't there before and i'll tell you what i mean so hooking animals by judy carter um she thanks a lot of people at the beginning she just seems like a lovely person and you know sprinkled throughout this book she puts quite a lot of uh quotes from famous people and they are all so meaningful and and sort of inserted at the right point in the text to make it very very um, important, like the thing that you need to hear at that moment, right? Like that thing that Mr. Rogers always talked about, the thing that you needed to hear at that moment. So at the beginning, right into the introduction, she puts in a quote by Zig Ziglar that says, you don't have to be great to start, but you do have to start to be great. That is so perfect, isn't it? Perfect. So, you know, in chapter one, she builds this bridge that I didn't know existed between um, Real, like real, we're just talking about animals tonight. So hooking realistically and hooking in a more primitive style. I think of those two things as completely disconnected, train tracks that will never cross. And yet in chapter one, Judy really does show how, how easily they cross and how often they cross. So chapter one, she talks about, it's called decisions, decisions, decisions. She talks about getting started with styles and cuts and visual aids. Now, Specifically in chapter one, she talks about wide cuts. So it, it becomes like immediately, how, Judy Carter, how are you going to hook wide cuts, right? You, doing your animal things. So this is what this chapter is about. I'm going to be doing a lot of paraphrasing, of course, because this is an enormous book and I highly recommend it. I put the Amazon affiliate link in this video. You can click on there if you want to buy this book. Of course, this was published by Rug Hooking Publisher, right? The press, the magazine. Um, so it's also available in their shop available in a lot of places it's it's current so decisions 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 she says right out of the gate should you that was good right for the animals right out of the gate by the way how weird is oh my god i think i got a sign i think i got a sign and i missed it let me take one more sip and i'll tell you what happened strangest thing now i think of it right out of the gate i was driving home from my mom's earlier with the kids in the car we got to a stoplight um, on this country road but it was quite a big route and there were goats in the road, like goats in the street. I shouted, goats in the street. And the kids went, oh, there's goats. In the there was goats all over the street. Like they had escaped from someone's yard and there were goats all over the street. Isn't that funny? Does that mean something? Is Judy like trying to contact us tonight? Because as soon as I said right out of the gate, I thought, 
the goats escaped from the gate and they were all over the street while I was driving my car to come over here and do this. Isn't that crazy? I think it might be a sign. I think it might be a message. Oh, thanks, Patricia. Whew, that was mystical and magical. So she says, wide cut versus primitive. Now, wide cut, this is her, this is her now, so I'm reading. Wide cut rugs are not necessarily primitive. Wide cut rugs can be very detailed and very realistic. It depends on the size of the rug. So this follows logically, right? If you are doing a rug for like the breakers in a, you know, the Gilded Age Mansion on uh, Bellevue Avenue, Newport, um, you can do that in number eight cuts. You could do that in cuts, you know, the size of like my neck. Um, and they're still gonna come out in detail because it's gonna be a monstrously big rug. When you're working much smaller, right, it's harder to work in um, wider cuts because you don't get that much detail. For example, I'll show you a very uh, poor example next to Judy's work, but while I was working last night on moose, this is all number eights and it's a very small rug. You know, I really have to kind of jig the, just looking at the antlers, um, being real careful with stacking and the, the trees, right? You see the little tree in the corner putting in some colors and branches, you really have to be careful with number eights when you don't have um, a big space, right, to really play and get a lot of detail. I, I tried to do traditional looking, primitive looking shading. Um, you have to be real careful when you got a small area and you're working with a wide cut because you are doing a primitive, right? If you are working a huge rug, you can certainly work in eights or even larger and get a lot of detail, even realism. It all depends on the scale. <laughs> Um, and she says, to obtain details in a wide cut rug, the rug must be large enough to incorporate the color changes and the additional lines and shading that will be needed to make it realistic. So she gives you some great examples. Oh, mom, you think the goats were assigned? Their spirits spurred on by duty to escape their confines and inspire you to energize us all with your passion. Oh, I'm sure it wasn't as grand as that, but I think it was Judy. Maybe she lifted the latch and the coach just ran all over the road. It really was something. Oh, you have her book, Carol. Carol, happy Friday. So let me show you some of the pictures that she uses as examples in chapter one for hooking animals, but more in the primitive slash traditional style. This first one is going to be, I like it though, mom. I love it. The first one is going to be Sally and the Flowers, hooked by Judy Carter. Uh, it is a design by Sue Hamer. Uh, available through the Honey Bee Hive, right, the store in Manchester, Connecticut. Wide cut rug includes yarn for the sheep, um, flowers, and the flowers were prodded. So let me show you this close up, hooked by Judy. Now, this isn't like the rug on the cover, right? Did you say ghosts or goats? No, I didn't say ghosts. I, they were definitely goats. I was trying very hard to stay away from them because they were all over the road, uh, bold as brass, as you can imagine. I'm hoping that they were caught up pretty quickly. I'm sure they were. But isn't this nice? And you can see the flowers in Prati. So this isn't the kind of style that I associate with Judy Carter, but you can see an artist as great as she was, uh, she can hook in any style. This is Aloysius, beautiful lion, designed by Emma Lou Lays and hooked by Nada Lind of Shepherdstown, West Virginia, 2002. And she puts the note in that Nada used blue and red. I'm going to show you the piece, and then, and then you can relate it to this. Nada used blue and red throughout this wide cut rug to ensure color balance, right? This is something we have to often talk about in composition classes. Let me show you the rug so you can start thinking about it. You see the many occurrences, let me come closer, of the blues and the reds, right? And check out this background too. I'm going to finish the text, but check out that background. Doesn't this remind you a little bit about the the whole uh, series on Anne Weissman, we were doing this past week. Remember her photos taking ferns in and branches from trees right from nature, almost like doing a, um, like the, the photo sort of negative, you know, with sunlight, um, putting shapes, silhouettes, organic shapes and silhouettes in the background of a fairly busy piece does give it a, a lot, adds a lot. Um, and what she says of this is that Note the shapes she hooked in the background. That's what we were just talking about. Because the line is basically one color. Uh, the movement in the background works well. Nada also hooks very high. So this rug is very plush and thick when you see it in person. That's interesting too, isn't it? Yeah, this background is great. And, you know, isn't it interesting that in this composition, you've got kind of the willow, and then you've got a very sort of Jacobian kind of cruel, uh, needlepoint cruel type style. Really interesting. And then the border is almost like an ethnic border, right? I mean, it has a kind of tribally look, whether it's like South American, North American, um, Eastern, hard to say, but very, very simple. There's also a small bird here sitting right on the hind hip. 
little red bird cardinal of some sort, right? Well, a little boy, I guess. Um, but very, very different uh, than I think the work that we associated with Judy Carter. Now, this one is going to blow you away because this is also hooked by Judy. Liberty Lineup, designed by Barbara Carroll of the Woolly Fox. Uh, note the purple. Okay, let me show you this. So, designed by Barbara Carroll and hooked by Judy. So, again, not exactly what we think of, but this shows Judy's versatility. She says, note that with this cat, you see the two different color eyes, one orange and one kind of lilac. Um, so this this is something that she was also perfectly capable of, this kind of color harmony, balance. Look at the great symmetry in this piece, right? The two cats here that almost mirror each other. I'm looking in reverse here. I'm not this much of a ding-dong. Um, well, anyway, the one, <laughs> the one on the far right and the one on the far left, the symmetry of stars, too, like a little very orderly constellation above. It's patriotic. It's cheerful. It really is a lovely piece, and it is hooked in number eights. Um, so this is all very possible. You don't have to hook animals in a realistic style if you don't want to. Um, I want to show you this one, too. This is called Peacock. Uh, and she says this was hooked by Celeste Bissett in Littleton, New Hampshire, 2012, uh, adapted from a Lewis Comfort Tiffany window and uh, designed and hooked by Celeste. Expertly dyed wool, which was hooked in the uh, perfect location in each section. We'll look at it rather than talk about it because it is extraordinary and it really truly does look like stained glass window, doesn't it? I mean, that is extraordinary. That is just extraordinary. And you know, when you get into dyeing, if you decide to get into dyeing, you can do such fun things with it. Now, what is saving this composition from becoming too um, busy? You know, obscuring the actual motif. Hey, Christine. Um, oh, you aren't late. You are great. You know, there's two things that are saving this composition from being, it is super successful. I'm sure you agree. It's super successful as a composition, um, but it's very, very busy. So two things are saving it. One of them is your eye already knows that this is a peacock, right? There's no question. You are not searching for what this is. This is very clearly a peacock. We have just a few feathers to give us clues, right? So that is the first thing. And the second thing is the outlining. And that is why it is so nice to hook uh, stained glass windows, whether they're Tiffany windows or church windows at your local church. Does it have any of your local churches have beautiful stained glass windows? Um, whether they're religious subjects or not, right? Sometimes you get sunrises and things like that, th things that are sort of neutral um, that you could put anywhere. If you're not particularly a church person, there are still subjects that are inspiring and stories that are inspiring. Um, as soon as you do something in the style of a stained glass window, you are outlining it. And it does take on a graphic quality, no matter how much hand-dyed wool you put in it, right? You can get any kind of color variation and change. As soon as you put in outlines, you are looking at a more graphic style as opposed to just straight up shadows. Then you're looking at a more realistic style. Both things work, I would say, equally well. It's just a matter of preference. And you never have to choose, right? One, one project you could do in a very graphic style, and then guess what? Next project, you're off your chain, and you're doing the complete opposite. And then next project after that, you didn't know there was a third way to go. But guess what? You're going in that third direction. And it changes every time, doesn't it? So you never have to choose. That's one of the great things about this craft, isn't it? So um, Peacock is head spinning. It really is. I love this piece. I want to show you this piece, too. Nightlife in the Country, a cut with number three, four, and five on rug warp. Uh, and, you know, if you're a beginner, rug warp is very, very tight, whether it's poly or cotton, it's very, very tight. You wouldn't want to be doing primitive cuts on it like in like a seven, eight, nine, because it's just it's so hard to pull every loop through because it's such tight backing. But if you're doing three, four, five, it's a really good backing choice. It's, it's a real preference thing. So on rug warp designed by Juliana Capistra or Capista uh, of Telford, um, Pennsylvania, 2013. I'm going to show it to you and then I'll read the caption. Isn't that gorgeous? I think I like this because it's so moody, isn't it? And, you know, wouldn't it have been easy to put in a white cat or a brown cat? Put the calico cat, it's so much more um, work. But look at how great that calico cat sets off that moon. That's like that full harvest moon, isn't it? And those beautiful big fat cabbages. Isn't that gorgeous? Bit of K facet in the middle of the night, huh? And the caption for that one said... The calico cat colors match the moon in this unique scene. Juliana outlined the cat with white, which identifies the shape of the head and leg and shows the glow of the cat from the light of the moon. So that's a good point, too. You know, 
she's saying outlining because they are outlined, but when you're tipping things in white that are directly under the light, it doesn't come off as a as an outline. I hope you're in focus there. It really comes out as light, right? When you look at anything really close up under the light, oh, here we go. Let me try one more time. When you look at anything really close up under the light, it does look absolutely white on top. Bit of a struggle there. You can see the cat face and the moon. Oh, interest. Oh my gosh, Doreen. You're right. Absolutely. So Doreen's saying she can see the cat face and the moon. I can see it now too. Definitely see the little two little nostrils in the center and that open mouth. It almost reminds me of a sheep. Isn't that funny? I wonder what that is. That is definitely looks like something embedded in there, right? Intentional. Because it doesn't just look like cheese, does it? <laughs> Um, and down below, you probably caught a glimpse of it, so I want to show you this great pattern by Joan Moshimer, um, hooked by Margaret Wenger of, Wenger of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, 2009, number four cut. This is completely different style. Horses of Nora. And I'll read you the text in a minute. Jay, could you put the fan facing in here? Yeah. I'm afraid I'm going to, like, expire. Are you? Yeah. Wow, here we go. Oh, dear, oh, dear, sorry. There we go. It has that feel of laurel birch, but I think more and better. Isn't that patterning fantastic? Multiples. Now, do you like the way that those two middle horses, the purple and the blue, fade into the background? Do you like that? Talk about a Van Gogh pattern. And check out the Prati Main. Hope you didn't hear that off camera. Check out the Prati Main, how exciting that looks. Doesn't it have a bit of a party atmosphere? The only reason I said, what do you think of the purple and the blue horse? Because what they're doing in terms of composition, I'm not going to do a composition talk tonight, but what they're doing, yes, yes, cat face in the moon, um, is interesting because they are almost like placeholders. They're creating space, right? They're giving, they're giving an illusion that there are more horses there, and there are more horses there, but they're also filling a spot like a placeholder so that there is a bit of relief for your eye. Warm colors, warm colors, warm colors, right? All these three warm colors, and then in the middle, these two cool colors, which are kind of fading into the background. Very, very clever design composition. It's also very clever to use those white saddles on the horses, I think. They could have been multicolor, but the fact that they're all the same color gives the composition some unity, right? It gives them some sameness. Your eye needs a bit of relief with something that's this colorful. It's a little bit hard to read at first glance. You get that it's horses, but it takes a minute to realize that it's actually five horses. And I think those saddles help uh, in sort of spotting the sameness in your eye goes, oh yeah, it's a whole row of horses, isn't it? Really, really stunning. Margaret uh, Wenger of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And then we get into um, what Judy is really <laughs> best known for. Poor, and I'm going to show you first the dog called Sapphire. This looks like a, a corgi, I think. Um, adapted by Leonard Feenan. He, she, she works a lot with Leonard Feenan from a photo portrait by Judy Taylor, pauseinthegarden.com, and hooked by Judy uh, Carter. Perfect, thank you. Um, in a private collection of Jean Brown. So uh, the caption says, Sapphire's personality comes, uh, comes out through the big blue eyes that pull the viewer in for a closer look. I'm going to show you these. We're going to talk about them more later. But this is Sapphire. Isn't that beautiful? What a sweet face, huh? And look at all that sort of color variation. Now, this background, this is not like a sort of um, um, fern silhouette outline background, is it? This is a very detailed background. And we'll see the actual photo later. So it's not, it's not after the photo of the background. It does have that ivy climbing up the wall, kind of English cottage timeless look to it. But the amount of work that's in those leaves, not just in the dog, is absolutely remarkable. And the colors are beautiful, almost like Australian shepherd colors. Very, very hard to achieve. And then, of course, this beauty that is on the cover. Now, these are very realistic. That is Hunter, Hunter the Lion. That is extraordinary. And that is, I think that's also Judy's. This is on Rug Warp, number three and four cut. Um, Hunter's expressive eyes were hooked with a few strips of leftover wool from another project. Many different wools were used to show the individual hairs on the animal that is mainly one color. Now that really is the thing, isn't it? This is the thing. With animals, when you think about them, they are one color. That's, that's one of the problems, isn't it? Uh, picking out the colors and really 
building on the cover, exaggerating the colors. Because otherwise, I mean, I don't think that sapphire is truly, has this much sort of red and purple. But you can see how you have to turn it into a bit of a tall tale, right? You really need to go a little bit further with your reds, with your browns. This shade here is beautiful in the cheek. You see this little bit of brown that's almost like bordering on ochre? Adding these extra colors. Now that that is the thing, isn't it? But she's going to show you how to do it in this book. She's not just going to show you pictures and say, good luck. See you later, sucker. She's going to show you how to do all of this stuff. Uh, and that's one of the things that's really remarkable about this book. I love this one, too. It's very different. Cockadoodle Doo, uh, number four, number six, just number four is number six, hand-dyed wool, designed and hooked by Judy Carter, 2001. Let me show you this one because it's very different than the ones we just saw, Cockadoodle Doo. Let me pull this in. And, you know, she's, she's using hand-dyed wool. And do you see in the bodies of the chickens, do you see what I mean about the exaggerated color? It is a bit of, of a tall tale color-wise. These are not typical colors, but you can see how using the kinds of things we do in our dye classes, pieces of wool that change color, right? The variegated color strips. You go from one to the next, ombre or more colors, you know, and you start hooking with it, you really get this glow and you get this unity. From one chicken to the next, they're all four different color palettes, and then the little chicks in the middle, almost like an afterthought, right under the sun. The shape of the sun is like a flower, too. So, you know, for me, this composition really balances out sort of folky charm, country charm, um, without being corny. You know, she's done a few little touches like the, the sunbeams and the chicks underneath that give it such, such a unique feel. It's very, very different. And for those of you that haven't heard this before, I'm going to give away one of the great uh, rug, rug hooking secrets. If you've seen the show every time, you already know this. But when you look at something like this and you say, how did she get those letters so perfect, right? This is it for beginners or for people that haven't hooked yet letters yet. The way that you get your letters so perfect is you hook the letters. For example, you're working like Judy in a four cut. You hook the letters in a six cut or a seven cut, a little bit bigger, right? You hook them, all the letters in, you hook around them, fill it all in, and then you pull the letters out and hook them in your four cut which is what you always meant to hook them in. And the reason you first hook them bigger is because that serves as a placeholder, right? The bigger wool strips serve as a placeholder because if you were just to hook the letters cockadoodle do right out of the gate and you hook around it, it's gonna crush them and deform them, right? And that's not gonna be good. It's gonna change the way that the letters look. You want them to have the sort of cursive feel, your handwriting. You want them to have that sort of bounce and that, that life that you gave them, that you chose. You don't want to hook them and have them look like something else, right? Different letters. So that is the secret. That is what rug hookers do who really know what they're doing when they're hooking anything filigree, not just letters, anything filigree. You put in your placeholder, and it can be just like really crappy material, like it could be anything. Pull it out and then put in what you mean to put in there, and it won't be crowded. It'll be able to stand up perfectly on its own. It'll be perfection. I'm sure that's probably what Judy did there. Tall tail coloring. You love that, Mom? <laughs> you're such a dud with coloring that's not true always stick to the bland expected no that is not true she's a crazy watercolor painter and puncher she does crazy things with colors she's excellent so <laughs> so moving forward um i like this quote too from one uh, renoir the painter one must from time to time attempt things that are beyond one's capacity now, that is true you know and at the end of the day you do. You have to attempt things that are beyond your capacity, but don't wait until someone forces you, right? Because when you're forced to do things that are outside your comfort zone, um, it's always so much more of a struggle, isn't it? Challenge yourself. Don't make, don't make somebody put you there. Challenge yourself to do things that are outside your comfort zone. Um, she talks about, oh, I just have to show you this quick, because um, this is not her signature style at all. But this is another one by Judy, designed by Barbara Carroll of the Woolly Fox. Number eight cuts again, showing a lot of primitives to us early on in the book. She shows us two. I'm going to show you both of these. This, the first one is Welcome You by Judy Carter, right? by Barbara Carroll, but hooked by Judy Carter. And again, beautiful, very symmetrical stars, very folky. Um, what I like about these compositions are sometimes when you get these sort of country compositions, they are a bit corny. 
Uh, these are not. This is so good, so patriotic and folky. And then look at this one. Look at that one. By the way, I watched my first Hallmark Christmas movie last night. It was just the worst. I mean, I love them. This was the one where the girl is um, accidentally dating the son of the actual Santa Claus. So you can imagine how, how well that worked. But, uh, you know, I still cried. It was great. It was, it was cathartic. But, yeah, it's probably too early. But, hey, I thought it was going to be a mystery, and it turned out to be a Christmas movie. What can you do? So <laughs> the Santa's called Prairie Santa and uh, Unmung's Cloth, designed by Barbara Carroll, Willie Fox, hooked by Judy Carter, 2002. Uh, the cat was hooked with the outline and fill method. I'm going to show you again so you can see that. The shapes and outlines were hooked first. Then the area was filled with a different color wool. The cow is one wool and uh, with texture for the spots. Okay, so let's look at that and translate that again. So she's saying, and she will say many times in this book, particularly when you're hooking animals primitive style, right? Not realism, except unless we're talking about that little glow of white light. I'm trying to come into focus again. There we go. So the cat is outlined. Sometimes you just have to do this, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. And she was making the point that the spots on the cow that was actually the material. So she wasn't doing anything fancy. She wasn't doing any of her fancy fills that she does when she's doing a lot of the work with fur in this book. This was just the way that the wool was. That's why it's so important to um, pick up wool. I'm not harking back to that big piece that I got as a gift just now. But, you know, when you see plaid wool and things like that, you know for sure, 1,000%, that Santa's jacket is a red and white check. Let me bring you back. Right? It can't possibly be anything but. I know it's not exactly in focus, but you see what I mean. That whole sleeve, certainly a black and white check. When you see these things, even if it's a small amount, just grab it. Just grab it because you don't know when you're going to want to use it later. And you cannot, you can dye anything you want, but you can't dye plaids and checks and houndstooths and all those great uh, window pane, you know, checkerboard patterns. You can't dye those. So you might as well pick them up because then you're able to do these colossal things with them. She says, my foray into hooking with narrower cuts of wool started with her piece called Phoenix of Peace. I'm going to show you that in a minute, which I created in a class with Michelle Micarelli, who you know is one of my great buddies. Michelle loves color and I wanted to play. I used bright colors and yarn to add to the realistic look of the tail feathers. So let's look at that. This definitely looks like it has a Michelle's energy in it for sure. I'm going to do like this just to get the picture in better. Right. So you can see Judy's really playing indeed with color here because she's quite realistic and literal in her hooking. Um, even with her primitive, she's hooking them in colors that you would fairly expect. The roosters are colorful, but they're still kind of reds and, and you know shiny colors that you would find in a feather. This really goes way outside that, the Phoenix of um, Peace. I mean, this really goes far outside uh, natural coloring. So this is a great example of one of her firsts and then she goes on to say and then i took a class with john probably going to mispronounce this but uh um uh chimi chimia wits um sorry if that was wrong i'm so sorry uh, obviously his work is stellar i just it's a tough last name she took a class with john in hooking animals um and this this brought like sort of a dramatic turn uh in her career in her direction in her um um, in her hooking life because she starts to look at animals and try to hook what she actually sees. So not doing primitives anymore because those were kind of earlier rugs, those years I was showing you like 2002, 2005. Um, you know, she says, I started to hook what I saw. He was able to teach her that. And with Cooper's hawk, I'm about to show you that, this is her first realistic animal piece. And she says, this hawk landed in her backyard and she was able to get a photo of it sitting in the bird bath. And then she asked John, to remove the bird bath and add a tree limb in a mountain range to give it a kind of a different setup. Um, the hawk remained in the neighborhood for years and now has a place in my home. So let me show you Cooper's hawk. And this again was her first realistic piece. Come back up here. Now, isn't that something? We're going to talk about this background a little bit later in the book. She does talk about backgrounds at the end of the book, but I mean, isn't this stunning? It's also a fantastic composition. I think I would have liked him on the birdbath too, but maybe that's a little too close to home, you know, like hanging out on the birdbath, waiting to kill something little. Um, maybe this is a bit better, but she does, well, you know what, let's just do it. 
I, I like the framing of this piece, right? It has almost a Maxfield Parrish look to it. Do you know the artist Maxfield Parrish? Um, the colors in the background. So let me show you the colors in the background again. You're thinking, how did she do that? She must be the best dyer in the world. She hooked it in white and then she painted it, right? She does this often in the background. She hooks it and then she paints it. You can paint it with little, uh, like, empty barrel, empty sort of cartridge uh, pens, like the ones I've shown before. They're on the floor under a pile somewhere. Um, or paintbrushes, you know, or sponges. But you can paint, you can hook your background and then paint it. And this is what she does in a lot of her work to get this Maxfield Parrish look, almost like an airbrushed look. Very, very even, but with distinct color changes. That is hard to do. Right. This is doing it this way. It's beautifully hooked. It's perfectly hooked. She hooked the mountains and everything. It's just the sun colors that she painted. So that's an idea, you know, and that's not a hard idea either. Do a little practice thing first. Cut, you know, hook a little all white or all one color, any color, right? It doesn't have to be white, like mug rug size thing, five by five, six by six, right? And, um, and then get out your paints. And I, I would get out like acrylic paints, um, water. No, would I get out acrylics? No, of course I wouldn't. What am I saying? I'm not painting like crafts um, too many years in the theater. I would get out like my dye stuff, whether it was organic or chemical, and I would put it into, I wish I had them handy now, but I got those pens off Amazon with the empty barrels. They're watercolor pens, but I would fill them up with dye, not hot water or they will implode, but I would fill them up with dye. Like again, or if you don't like the chemical dyes, um, and if you do use the proper precautions, of course, but you could do it with natural dyes. You could even get some like black chestnuts or whatever from outside, whatever's happening in your yard right now in this season and fill the barrel up with that and then just paint just to practice because you still have to be conscious of the individual loops, but at least you could practice what the feel would look like, right? Interesting. You could even, if you do dyeing, just fill up mason jars and things with uh, leftover color so that it's not a full blast, full on color, but it's a bit diluted, you know? Um, that could work really well. Cooper's Hawk with the painted background, yowza. Yeah, it, it, it's just like Matt, it's the, there's no limit. There's no limit, mm -mm. remember that song? Um, yeah, there's no limit. And it's so interesting because again, I say this in every class that I do, people, I think people think that rug hooking is about making rugs for the floor and it's just not, and we know that. It's about doing a textile art where the sky is the limit, is absolutely the limit. You can layer things on, you can do things like painting the background, the, the sky is absolutely the limit. Small cut, wide cut, prodi, uh, quilly, there's so many things that you can do, it's just crazy. So she actually goes into phenomenal detail. The peacock was amazing, Carol. She goes into phenomenal detail with helping you to figure out what your colors are gonna be. Um, and she talks about things like, for example, let me read this part. Uh, visuals for wide cut rugs. So if indeed you are going to do like a wide cut, more of a primitive cut, remember primitive doesn't mean it doesn't have detail. Depends on the size of your rug, right? She says to plan a primitive or wide cut rug, start with a favorite wool and then gather additional wools that complement and contrast it. Use a color palette that you enjoy and find wools that look good with your favorite wool. So she's saying start with one and then build off of it. She's saying start with one wool and here's a good example. This photo here. Start with one, like the one that Jay just brought in here, and then you look at it and you go, oh, there's a little bit of red, there's a little bit of copper, a little bit of rust, oh, there's a little bit of teal, a tiny bit of purple, and then you pull those colors too. You pull other things, whether they're solids or uh, plaids or whatever, you know, you pull them from your stash, and you put just a few of them together. In this case, she's suggesting one, two, she's suggesting four. Of course, you're gonna need more than that, but just to get going as your color palette, um, she's very, very detail oriented. So whether you plan to work in realism or not, whether you plan to hook animals or not, really doesn't matter. This book is, can translate to anything that you're doing, uh, not just in rug hooking, but in any art. She's talking a lot about color planning and she's talking about it in a very practical way. She's not, she hasn't shown us one color wheel in this book and she's not going to. Maybe rug hooking needs a new name. Debbie, we talk about that all the time behind the scenes here. Um, we talk about that all the time because, you know, when we say rug hooking, we're number one eliminating punch needle, which is super, super similar. I mean, they're interchangeable. You're just holding a different tool. Um, we talk about all kinds of rug work and they all have different names. It's not cohesive at all. It's very frustrating. Um, I think the closest thing that we have to describing all the kinds of rug making we do is saying rag rugs. I still think that's probably the best universal phrase because when you think about it, 
if you're a punch needle person, you're searching punch needle things on the internet, you're not going to pull up things about rug hooking because they're completely different words, but they really have 99% crossover. Uh, it's very, it's very tricky. It's very tricky. Uh, the British and the Canadians have done a much better job using the term rag and using terms like rugger instead of hooker. Um, and a rugger would be someone, remember George Wells, his ruggery on Long Island, mid-century? Not using words like that or letting them fade out of our kind of, um, our rug hooker's dialect is, um, is bad because those words are very universal and they're very, they're shapeshifters, right? We have to bring these sort of general words back so we can include everybody and talk more generally. I, I completely agree with that. Now she talks about, um, she says, there's no better way to plant an animal rug, um, visuals for fine cuts, there's no better way to plant an animal rug in its colors than to follow a photograph. And she means exactly. So I will say here, this is a very specific opinion. If you are doing a photorealist rug of an animal, it will be best to use a photograph. Absolutely. Um, Again, it is going to depend on how much you want, how much realism you want in your piece, right? Because the Tiffany piece is not worked off of a, a photograph. It's certainly worked off of another piece of art, maybe a photograph of a stained glass window. Uh, it could be worked off a sculpture. There could easily be a sculpture that looked like that peacock, right? And you could work off that looking at the colors and the way the light hit the colors. Um, but in any case, it is good to have a visual aid that you feel is stable, and, meaning it's not going to change color on you. Um, that you'll be able to return to the colors you were first looking at. Um, and also something that if you are a very literal person and you don't plan to put a lot of uh, twist into it, uh, that it gives you enough information in looking at it that you'll be able to translate that into what you're doing, that there's enough cues in there for you. So she says a photograph is the best. And when using a photograph, uh, she says you're just letting nature do the color planning for you. So in other words, there's the peacock, right? Or there's a peacock and an owl and a, a beautiful, I think, bull terrier, um, you know, certainly. And then here's our buddy, Sapphire, right? And I actually like the finished rug more than this picture because it had all those tall tail colors in it. Right? It had all the tall tails, all the purples and the rusts and a little bit of ochre. And, you know, chapter two, she starts to talk about going into your stash and choosing colors, finding colors, doing the thing that she's already outlined um, planning. You know, she does stuff like this when she's planning a rug. She does little swatches and things. She lays all the colors out, right? Who's this? Oh, that's the owl. Lays all the colors out that she plans to use. Oh, look at this little face. All the sort of fleshy colors on the monkey's face. She has different systems for laying all of her colors out. So it has a shape. The project has a shape. She knows what she's looking at now. Here's my palette. Uh, and then she'll expand on it. So this chapter is very much about and she puts into her basket, right? She's got things with like punched holes, cards like DMC floss cards. You're right, Debbie. So many projects these days aren't rugs. Um, you're right. You're right. I, we probably need a completely different word, and I have been racking my brain for that word. Kira and I have been doing the craziest. Um, there's a lot of things that I can't say that we, we come up with, but the craziest um, fusions of words to try to give us uh, more clarity and to give our craft um, just better language, right? Just better language. I was trying to think of more words for coffee time and more names last night so more people can find our coffee time show. And I think we're going to be, it won't matter to you because you're already here, but I think we're going to fuse it with our Facebook name, which is the Rug Hooking and Punch Needing Co Needle Coffee Club. Um, but I did want to call it the the um, coffee cast, like, you know, like broadcast, whatever. But then people wouldn't find that either. But I like the word coffee cast. We've been fusing words like crazy. We came up with one last night. It wasn't one of the bad ones, Kirsten, don't worry. It was, she said, we were talking about something that was both primitive and a bit tacky. And she, she came up with the word pracky, which I thought was amazing. And then it evolved into pricky pracky. Um, so there are all kinds of words. I think we should create a new, you know, a new uh, Webster's Dictionary, and it'll be our own. We'll have a glossary that is just our funny words, but we know exactly what they mean, and they'd be such specific words that there is no other word for it, right? We're creating language as we go along. Yep, you're right. You're right, Tara. So she goes on to show us all kinds of things about texture and gathering. Well, she does use a lot of textures, I have to say, and it, it will it would have always benefited her to use textures because solids, you just get the color. With texture, you get multicolors. And as you know, how does it hook? 
plaids and, and different kinds of checks, houndstooth, all of those things, they hook with a lot of texture. You don't get texture from hooking a solid. So it was very wise of her to constantly be going toward different kinds of checks and plaids because it's going to give you that built-in leg up, isn't it? Um, and she talks about how to tighten up those textures. She talks a lot about washing wool, fulling it, right, making it more full so that you can hook with it. Um, a lot of this, she has a whole chapter on eyes, and it's just, it, it's so, it's so intense. I mean, it's so amazing, right? If you have this book, you've already looked at these in detail and gone, are you kidding me? Look at this one here. This one, to me, is, is a crazy one. It, I was wondering first, is it a nose or an eye, but it's an eye. You know, she's got a little bit of, of yarn or wool in the center that has a little bit of a mohairy thing going on. You can see there's an airiness to it. And my word, that is super, super pop, poppy, like it's popping out uh, realism. I mean, that's just extraordinary. Oh, that is okay. Better. I'm not even going to say better late than never. You are welcome always. You are welcome always. And we're in the middle of the fun. Uh, but, you know, whole chapter on eyes, and she gives you so much detail on how to do them. She shows you things like this. You know, not every teacher tells you how they work. This is why I'm telling you about the thing with the words, with hooking in a placeholder and pulling it out, because there are so many teachers who will not tell you their great secrets because they want to, they want to remain with a sort of edge to their work, like this sort of um, je ne sais quoi that is nobody knows how they did it, right? Like Houdini style hooking, Houdini hooking, there's another one. Um, but Judy was not like that. Judy's telling you exactly what she does. This is what she does. She takes the wool, right? It's not going to come out exactly like this because how does it hook? Hooks different. But she's just got the flat pieces out, almost like she's getting ready for an applique project. She does Doreen. She does the most beautiful eyes. Um, could you use liquid, um, not dye, like writ? Yeah, I, you absolutely could. I mean, there are still people who use, I don't mean to make them sound separate than, than we are, that use writ for dyeing their wool now. Um, you know, going back to the 70s, if you remember the Alice Butler episodes, they only used writ. Um, and all that stuff is very lasting. It's still around today. Writ is better now than it was before. But yes, you could certainly get dyes that are pre-colored, th that are already liquid. I would just say if you are going to do that, I would be very, very, very inclined to water it down a lot first. Because, for example, if you get even light blue or sky blue from writ, whatever that would be, Copenhagen blue or whatever, um, it's going to be very intense. I would first water it way down until you think, well, there's not that much color left in there. I must have made a mistake because it's probably it's still going to come out quite blue, right? Uh, but yeah, there's no reason on earth why you shouldn't do that. That It's a very good idea to do that, in fact, because that's a great shortcut. If you don't want to start fooling around with citric acid in synthropol and all of the trappings that come with doing chemical dyeing, um, there are dyes that are out there that are already liquid for you. But again, just water them down a ton. And remember those great hairdresser squirt bottles that they sell on Amazon? Make sure you type in the word hairdresser. They come with either a black or a red tip, right? And once you open them, they're open. It's not like they turn or anything. You want to stick with the hairdresser bottles because some of the other bottles are not temperature safe and they will implode and the dye will shoot like all over the ceiling in your body uh, if you put hot water in there with, you know, to, to activate the color. But if you stick with those hairdresser bottles and you put in a little bit of writ, you can water it down and test that. You can always add more of the color. Uh, but once you, once you do that first squirt, didn't sound good, but you know what I mean. Rit is strong like food coloring. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we sometimes use food coloring to do dye too. You see videos of that. I've done videos of that using food coloring to dye. It's not a super powerful dye, um, but it, it's possible. It's possible. If, you know, you're not planning to do any crazy washing or a lot of wear and tear. If it's not a floor rug, it's gonna it's gonna work. It's gonna change your color. So all of these things are possibilities. These are great suggestions. These are really good suggestions. So start with the eyes. So yeah, she creates like a little applique eye just to show herself and remind herself, you know, again, if she's looking at this eyeball, if you can see, it's got like that piece that I just showed you that came from Goodwill. It's got a lot of reds in there and rusts in there. And she's already laid out where she want, wants to put those highlight dots in pure white. Remember the page before with a little bit of mohair? Pure white. You know, she's showing you all the color variation of what this is going to look like. She's she's consulting. She puts it there for herself. Yes, yeah, she uses a little bit of wool to do it, but, you know, she probably then cuts that wool and hooks with it. Eye is just a tiny little thing. 
every chapter in this book um, are tips on something very specific. Of course, this translates to a human eye as well as it would, you know, when, when Betty was hooking the class with Sharon Smith and she was doing the human hair on her grandchild, it, doing, human, doing animal hair worked exactly the same way. All of this stuff translates, right, whether you do animals or not. Another great quote from Charles Mingus, making the simple complicated is commonplace, but making the, sim the complicated simple, awesomely simple, now that's creative. It's creative and difficult, right? That speaks to that constant phrase that we're saying, you know, simple is hard. Simple is very hard. Uh, lots of bells and whistles is a lot easier. She gives you tips in every chapter, things like eye tips, just tips about eyes. Start by hooking the outline of the eye to hold the shape, right? Placeholder. Mix wools uh, of values for the iris or values for the iris at a highlight. Use a stark contrast. And she's got a whole list of them. I won't do all of them because I want you to get the book if you're interested. But you see those dots? How much does this look like the eye that we just saw as the placeholder? Exactly. Exactly. And it's brightened up by all the sort of fur around it. But absolutely spot on. So lots on eyes. And then the next chapter is on noses. And so, are you kidding me? Look at this little face. This is a photo, but look at this little face. Are you kidding me? And then she's got, she's working on the little face, right? Piece by piece. That's a dog's nose on that side. But she's talking about noses in this chapter. Who thought there could be a chapter about noses? But uh, it's a big deal because noses are typically one color, like pinky pink or really dark black, and they don't have a lot of definition. And it's very hard without resorting to line drawing and outlining. If you are sticking with the realism, it's very hard to get that color variation in something like a nose that is truly one color. An eye, now that's many colors and many lines, but a nose, trickier, right? So she's got a whole chapter on noses and a whole chapter on ears. And again, whether you plan to hook animals or not, whether you plan to hook in a realistic style or not, it is just delicious to go through this book and look at these photos, these close-up photos of colors. Sometimes I can't tell what body part it is. I guess that's an ear. But all of these colors, the tall tales of colors just popping out, it really makes you think. Right? The center of a goat's ear, that little bit of red in the center, that, that's a huge blow up, right? Much smaller in real life. That's just going to look like a little glow of pink. Um, so she goes chapter by chapter, and then she talks about fur. Uh, and, and this chapter is called The Long and the Short of It. And she shows this great piece by Marion Hall of Westchester, Pennsylvania. Marion used many colors and values and started and stopped her rows at varying lengths to hook these adorable dogs. That's a great tip in and of itself. Um, Karen says, there's a medium to add to acrylic for painting on fabric. Oh, that sounds good. I wonder, do you think like Jackard or one of those companies put something like that out? That makes a lot of sense that there would be a medium so it can tran it could shift, right? The properties can shift. That's a good thought. Um, Karen, let me know if you think that's a Jackard product. It seems like the kind of thing that they would do. But yeah, these dogs are just too darn cute. And again, the, the hint and the clue here is to hook the hair at different lengths. If you have it all at one length, you've got cousin it, right? But when you do it all at different lengths like this, you've really got character, personality. It looks a lot more realistic. So this whole chapter is about hooking hair and it is just, it's, fanta it's fantastic. And again, tips for hooking hair. Hook it in rows. You want to go straight down. You don't want to do higgledy pickledies. It really needs to, to translate as a strand or a piece, right? Uh, mix wools randomly. Do not hook in stripes. Start and st uh, stop at different places. These are all great. These would all probably sound very familiar to Betty uh, because of Judy's kindness in going over, you know, during this conversation and saying, I know something about that. I know something about hooking hair, hooking animals hair, but still, I think you can use what I know. And sure enough, that's what, a, that's what a really good person does, isn't it? There's a whole part on hooking whiskers, tips on hooking whiskers. We're going to, I'm going to show you more on that in a minute. Now, this is interesting. I'll, sh I'll, sh I'll, I'll, I'll show you how this resolves itself in a minute, but this is in the conversation about whiskers, and she shows you two different, um, versions of the same pattern of a lion and is quite stylized. Now the top one is by Margaret Wenger. Um, we've seen some of her work already, glorious. And the bottom one is by Judy herself. And you see how different the treatment is on these two lion's faces if we're just looking at whiskers. 
I mean, you can look at all the lines, but you see a very different treatment. So the bottom is Judy, the top is Margaret. Sue's. Oh, Sue says, I believe one could add turpentine or paint thinner to oil paint on linen. I mean, that sounds okay because, of course, a fine painter's paint on linen canvas, um, and they do they do use that, you know, to thin paint. That would definitely work. I, if you are going to do that, you want to be careful about your drying time because you know oil is a killer for drying time. Acrylic is like minutes. Oil is, is like days or weeks. Um, so just a thought, but that would definitely be a thing because, of course, every fine artist through history is painted on uh, linen or, or a close relative of linen, uh, and that those products always work beautifully on there. So that it, that's a good one. That's a good one, Suze. Let's put that into our bag of tricks for this. See, I, I knew parts of this show were going to pop, and you all are very interested in this side conversation about painting the background. And I'm, I'm following this, too, because I'm very interested in doing this, too. You know, and it's not a shortcut, is it? Because you still have to hook the whole thing. It's just the opportunity to give all or part of your composition a very different look, isn't it? And you know, when I think about it, are any of you familiar with theorem painting, theorem or theorem painting, T-H-E-O-R-U-M? It's painting on velvet, the Victorian art of painting on velvet. That was one of the many classes my mom and I did back in the day where I would give her a class every Christmas that we would both go on. And um, theorem painting was one of them. And yet we made stencils. Edward, yeah, give me that theorem. <laughs> You're listening. <laughs> you Jay, Jay just happens to have one on hand because he's, he's running an auction. Um, this is inside a, th uh, a thing, but this is white grapes. I really like this. This is a theorem painting. And what it is, is it's a painting that revolves around a stencil. So you're using a st you're not using one stencil, you're using a series of stencils, right? A series. And you're, with each stencil, you're applying a different color of paint. So you're doing all the whites or the shapes of the grapes, some of them, not all, with one stencil. Of course, you couldn't have them all and they'd be overlapping. And then the next one, you layer it down almost like a silk screen and do your next layer. Now, this idea of th a theorem, a theorem painting. I'm not talking about Elvis painting on velvet. This is very, very different, right? Uh, something to look up if you don't know it, because this is a great crossover to quilting applique style, Baltimore style quilting, um, and also rug hooking. So I'm just wondering, with this as an inspiration, and do you see how much pink is in those little grapes too? Do you see pink in there? I don't have my, I just took my glasses off. I'm using them as a bookmark. But I'm wondering if you were to hook, whether it was a wide cut or a um, skinny cut, like anything, th if you're doing a three or you're doing a nine, if you were to hook a whole thing in one color, for example, that nice creamy spilled milk color of that one, um, and then you were to take a stencil, theorem, st theorem I would say theorem style, um, to establish with paint, some lines you would be you would be getting very very close to the sort of Edward Sands Frost idea but not on your backing fabric directly on your finished loops right on your pile I mean that would be interesting wouldn't it somebody's going to do that for Rogue Cooking Magazine I'm going to get left in the dust again but I think that's a really interesting idea you do it you run with it uh, Patricia says I've been using writ dye to dye floss but I'd like to try it on wool. Absolutely, why not? People do. You know, people don't always say what they're using because they're afraid other people are going to blast them. And it's a shame that it works like that, but it does. There is uh, a very um, um, defined sort of coven of witches associated with rug hooking. And I know you're thinking of some of their faces right now. Um, we all have different ones in our lives. But you know, those are the people you don't want to say the wrong thing in front of at an ATHA meeting. Uh, or on a public forum. So people tend to not say when they're using products like RIT, and I always appreciate it when people do say, because there is nothing wrong with it. It's just, it's a different brand. It's not, you know, they have not through the years catered like Cushing or Diamond to uh, wool or the hooking trade, but who cares? Artist with a capital A or not, who cares, right? So I'm so happy when people volunteer information like that because it, it all makes sense. And other people are thinking, I wonder if I could use red dye, why shouldn't I? And then they're thinking there must be a reason. Well, there is no reason. It's just people don't always tell you what they're doing because they're either secretive or they're afraid that you're gonna say something negative about what their t technique or secret is. And they don't wanna risk getting criticism. So it's very nice to be forthcoming and we always are here. And I really appreciate that about all of you. 
Hello, Lisa. I was talking about you earlier because we were talking about Pennsylvania quite a bit because Judy Carter's in Pennsylvania and I'm still planning to come visit you. We're going to have to firm all that up. We're doing Pennsylvania talk, so of course I thought of you right away. Gail, good to see you. You know, Gail, you're not late. You're early because I know you're in Australia, so you are very early. Good morning, and I won't even tell you what I'm drinking because it'll turn your stomach. But happy orange juice and coffee time. I'm very happy that you're there. Oh, okay, Karen says, I use Decorative Americana Textile Medium. Very nice. You know, that's a nice brand. Um, Joann's Michaels, you know, they have these acrylic paints, not in tubes, but in little bottles, right? Usually a whole aisle of them. Folk Art, Decorative, the Americanas are very nice. That's the Folk Art brand. There's a whole bunch of them. I would go for the more expensive ones because the cheaper ones, like the Americana and the Deltas, are great. The cheaper ones, like the store brand, they're super sketchy and they're 90% liquid, you know, like it hasn't m melded together. But that's a great idea, too. I've never used any of their mediums. So Karen's saying she uses that medium. That's perfect. It's not going to cost a fortune. It's going to be at the craft box store, whatever one is yours. That's going to work great, right? Um... Uh, Patricia says, I use it on floss and I've gotten wonderful color combos. Fantastic. See how well we work when we all work together? And Barbara says, we use RIT to dye t-shirts. Absolutely. Absolutely. See, we should start a RIT fan club. Who's going to put Who's gonna put that Facebook page up and invite Coven of Witches from the Rug Hooking Group to cross over? Oh, good, Gail. You get your day started. So let's look at how these two rugs turn out, the lion faces. Before we go too far astray, let's look at how these two faces turn out in the finished rugs. I think you're going to love this. So these are the two finished. Let me stand up. These are the two finished lions. So of course the one with the blues is Margaret's, right? The one that's a bit more stylized. And the and this is a, I think this is Wooly Fox, Barbara. Oh no, this is an Edith O'Neill, also Wooly Fox. Edith O'Neill design. You know we love Edith O'Neill, the, the Red House episodes that we did. Uh, so the one that's more autumn colors is Judy's, and the one that's more blue colors is Margaret's. You know, I love this pattern. I'm going to have to look for this on the Wooly Fox. I would love to have this. I would call this artichoke head lion. Doesn't it look like a little artichoke or a little Brussels sprout or something? More of an artichoke, right? More of an artichoke head. I just love this pattern. I love them both. I really love, I, I like Margaret's colors for myself better. But the other one is very much more Judy's style, right? So you can see how, for example, outlining helps a lot. And you see how in Barbara's example, white whiskers, Margaret's example, dark whiskers. And you see it really does, it, it shows differently. And certainly Judy has a bit more coloration on the face, but you see how outlining saves the day with this one. Judy's doing a lot with color here. She's doing, she's doing very simple shading in a primitive style. But you see, Margaret's doing outlining, and it's also working. There's a little bit of pink on the sides. She's doing a little bit of shading, um, but both styles work. If you're not good at one, just do the other one. If if you want to get better at the other one, practice. If you don't get, if you don't want to get better at the other one, just keep outlining. Who cares? If it looks right to you, then you're already there, right? You're already there. So chapter seven, she talks about feathers, right? Carrying on with um, such specifics, peacock feathers and oh, chest and body feathers. You know, she shows examples of other people's work. And for example, Hyacinth Macaw, uh, Sibylosica. Remember, we did some shows on Sibylosica too. Now, I immediately thought of her before I started this episode because she does so many animals as well. I remember that from doing that when we were together for coffee time, um, doing those shows on Sibylosica's book. So Judy says, in Hyacinth Macaw, let me show you first. And I'm going to show you again. I'm going to show you closer up. But this is what we're talking about here. She says, Sybil Osika used swatches and fine shading to create the smooth transition of values throughout the feathers of the macaws. Your mind's eye knows that they're feathers, even though the artist hasn't defined each and every feather. Let's look at that really close up. We'll make sure we're in focus. So the message here with the macaws is not every feather is in focus. You see how right around the neck, it's a little bit lighter. The stomach gets a little bit darker, and then down by the tail, lighter again. And same thing with the one below. Kind of tipping feathers, stylized, but you know there's more feathers than, for example, four, five, six, seven, ten. Right? You know there's more feathers than that. So she's just giving the suggestion. She's giving color change cues that give the suggestion that there are color changes. But she is not hooking every single feather. So although this is fairly realistic, 
it's it's not realistic the way that Judy's can be realistic, right? Sybil does other things that are wildly realistic, but we're talking about just the macaws in this case. So in contrast to that, uh, Liz Marino, um, in Caught, I'm going to show you this piece too, contrast wool to differentiate the individual feathers on her heron. So um, she hooked the individual feathers in the reflection as well, which shows the calmness of the water. Um, so let me show you that in contrast. Dave says, paint markers, Prisma Mark, would give great control on the loops. One could thin it with water, permanent when dry, easy to hook with. Jay, can you come in for a minute? I'm going to see if I can find these because I have these on the floor and I would love to show them so you know what I mean. Can you just check right here? There was a package of markers that fell under this garbage uh, heap. They're like still in the package from Amazon. They're like individual markers in a little thing. I would love to show them. Isn't it funny when you know you filed something on the floor, uh, but you were too lazy to do anything about it the first 150 times you noticed that they were filed on the floor? We'll see if he can find them. He might not. But yes, Dave, they are fantastic, and they are on Amazon. And they typically come, it's very hard to not get them in a variety of sizes. So they come in a pack from like very, very fine, long felt tip to uh, quite, quite big and wide. So those are fantastic, and those are the ones with the little reservoir that you could fill. I wouldn't put boiling water into them. I would just put regular water with a little drop of dye or rich or food coloring, not finding it. I'll find them. I'll show them to you this week on Coffee Time. Thank you for looking. They could be under the anything. Yeah. So, okay, let me show you Heron and Liz Marino's example of more sort of individual feathers as opposed to macaw, right? Heron has... A lot more going on with individual feathers. What color bucks? They're they're loose in a pack, and you can see all. It's like cellophane. Yeah, I gotcha. yeah you can see all the pens through the wrapping. Oh. And again, the reflection shows the calmness of the water. Caught by Liz Marino. Edgar, um, what was it? Was she not? I was going to say Edgar Town. Where is she from? Oh, mom, where's that place in the Berkshires that you and Dad used to go? The hotel that burnt down. Egremont, Egremont, there it is, Egremont, uh, Massachusetts. That's where Liz Marino's from. So that is a great example of a little bit more detail in the feathers. One is not better than the other. They are different styles, right? And, and you, you know, we don't even, I don't even want to think in terms of a scale of how graphic something is as opposed to how detailed something is, because I don't like to measure things that way. I would prefer to get a feel uh, for something th with my eyes and my heart, my senses, my, my thoughts, making thought connections rather than uh, sort of measuring things on some kind of a weird scale. But certainly one has more detail than the other, and they are both super successful uh, as, finished, as finished pieces. So then she has a chapter on skin and scales. Great quote from Vincent Van Gogh. I am seeking, I am striving, I am in it with all my heart. He said some great things. Even once it's translated from Dutch, it still sounds fantastic, doesn't it? Oh, Gail, I was just being a jerk. You know, I was just saying, um, I, I was making the point that there are products like RIT dye. I don't know if you use that in Australia. Um, but sometimes people are reluctant to say what they're using at home because it's not a super fancy, expensive thing. And there are people who are very traditional into rug hooking who are a, a bit more high horse, like a bit more in the rug hooking snob um, camp. And I sometimes refer to those people as a coven of witches. And I know I shouldn't, but I have specific people in mind when I say that, um, that I will never tell. But, um, you know, those are the people who I would never say that I used RIT dye in front of. And that is the reason that more people don't know that you can use RIT dye. Because um, with social media and everything else, sometimes people don't want to get blasted by other people by saying, RIT dye, um, you know my word but people do use all of these different things and they do work there's a lot of things that are cheap and work and it's nice when we talk about those things out loud because that other people know there's absolutely nothing wrong with for example writ dye but that was my connection to which is we're not doing a halloween episode i was just being a bit of a jerk what uh 15 minutes so she's doing her scales thing here and she's not using textured wool she's changing colors out Right, so she's, you can see that this is the unfinished part here. She's going to fill in all those parts with color. So she's doing real sort of cross-hatching with very thin wool strips. Uh, and she makes the comment many times in this book, when you're going to do this stuff, you really have to use uh, thin cuts. 
like number threes. Number threes, maybe number fours. I'd say number threes. Um, because as soon as you get to a wider strip, you're looking at more of a rectangle loop coming up as opposed to a dit dot, like a pointillist, Seurat style dit dot. That's really what you want when you're looking to do this kind of detail and this much texture. <laughs> um, you're giving me ideas for the Van Gogh project. Ooh, Patricia, that's a great idea. I won't say that one again, because that, do it. Go with that, that is fantastic. A whole chapter on fish, right? I mean, there's so many people who fish and want to make things for someone in their life who's a great fisher, fisherman, fisherwoman. Um, so she's showing us great examples of everything, examples of sort of um, appliquing onto pieces with different materials. For example, Sapphire the dog is sitting in this basket. Let me come a little bit closer. And it's not hooked. It is, you can see, kind of um, almost like a weave. They're, she's doing it with a hook, I'm sure, but she's bringing over long pieces. If you sort of equate this to remember Bargello in the 1970s, uh, long stitch. It's doing a long stitch with wool strips as opposed to, you know, needle needlework. But same idea, works exactly the same way. No reason why you shouldn't do that. She's talking about all kinds of little hacks and tricks. Another really cute face right there. Um, for getting effects that you want that are a little bit non-traditional. And then she does a whole piece on contrast. And in this chapter, she does talk about outlining. You see the Noah's Ark piece here, uh, top and bottom. She is outlining. And she's outlining because she must, right? I mean, she really is. <laughs> you do, Christy, I'm sure. I, most of us do who put ourselves out there and got shot down a few times. Um, so, you know, she gets into uh, such a tremendous detail. She talks about every part of the body, including muscle. You know, we don't always think about that with animals, but particularly wild animals and certainly horses. You do need to think about muscle and talk about muscle and where it is and how to um, deal with it so that it comes out. Um, as best as it can if you are going for a very realistic style again use the photograph she says and then she's got a huge gallery at the end where she shows us beautiful animals but look at these great different backgrounds and sort of concentric circles going on on the Doberman and then on the orangutan more of like the marble cake squiggles going on a beautiful gallery lots of animals lots of work by many different people but lots of Judy's own pieces in here and here is a close-up of um, the peacock with the painted background. And she does say in this chapter that she, she doesn't say what she painted it with or if she used any mediums, but she does say that she painted the background. So we have absolute confirmation on that. That's a close up of that. I think this was the favorite sideline of the night, wasn't it? Talking about those painted, those painted loops in the background. Um, but, and then she talks about using sort of um, different materials to make things pop, for example, Look at Bunny over here, this fluffiness right here. It is a fantastic book, Gail, it's great. Using sort of non-conventional things, real wool, real woving, uh, roving, um, real curls, real sheep curls, right? You can get those too. Um, adding all these kinds of things, using yarn in the fringe of a horse, right? It looks like this, but using yarn to create that kind of length and uh, floppy kind of feel of that little mane, proddy. That's a real extreme example, but very, very stylized, isn't it? That lion's mane. So she ta she knows she's not just talking about traditional rug hooking. She's talking about all kinds of things that you can add to make something special and different. This is great. The um, chicken sitting on his nest of prati. And can you see that these are like, the, the eggs are Waldboro, meaning they're densely, densely, densely hooked in a very, very small cut really really high right and then they use little scissors like little bonsai trees zip uh, scissors to make it three-dimensional kind of like a modern aubusson type rug uh Waldebro. we've talked about that many times too we'll certainly return to it but so many different techniques in one piece and she talks about interpretation how you might interpret something somebody interpreted the mane like this with these wild curls and somebody with actual curls right Ch -ch 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 i mean it looks so real it's crazy um, super, super effective, both of them, so different. And then her two lions. So this book really has something for everyone, I think. Um, interesting things to talk about different people, different backgrounds. I mean, would you think to put a giraffe skin background behind a giraffe? Because I wouldn't, but it really is striking. But then these two giraffes look fantastic too. Everybody's special and different. Everybody's work is special and different. 
And you know, there is a pattern, right? There's a pattern in here, a full size pattern. And she walks you through the whole thing in the back. It's the chicken. Oh, by the way, this is the Noah's Ark. I just want to show you because all of these are outlined. And you know, again, uh, the reason I'm showing this is because she does acknowledge, I'm trying to get up in front of the light. She does acknowledge sometimes you really do have to outline in a composition this busy. You know, she's not going to shade every single thing. She's going to she's going to outline some of them, particularly against the sky to make them pop. And the ones on the ground, I think, are all outlined, too. At least a couple lines here and there. Not maybe all the way around, but a little bit here and there. Um, so, yeah, she does give you this pattern, Rusty the Rooster, at the end of the book. And she shows you, that's the pullout pattern. She shows you step by step how she chooses her colors and step-by-step uh, step how to hook every single part of him. Now he's gonna be a good one to, to do something realistic on because he's got many colors. He's got feathers, he's got uh, body parts that are, that are sort of flat like this, very color changing parts where she's gonna show you how to do the best. The long sort of feathers around his neck, the golden feathers around his neck where you're gonna use those long straight shots going right down like hair. So this was a great animal to start with. Um, and then at the very end, she talks about labeling and, and, and finishing. One page on labeling, one page on finishing. So this is a fantastic book. You know, I wish that Judy had written a, a thousand books or 10,000 books. Um, she wrote this book, and this really is, this is a great legacy in, in and of itself because this gives us so many ideas. And remarkably, talk about names not quite fitting. It's not really about hooking animals, is it? It's about everything. It's about everything. I mean, whether you hook animals or not, again, this book is for you because these techniques um, are universal. And the inspiration, the quotes, her one-liners, her, her tip boxes on almost every page giving you great tips. Those tips are universal for animals or not animals. You can definitely translate them to fit whatever project you're working on at this moment. So this just really is a great book, Hooking Animals. How to Bring Animals to Life in Wool Rugs. And again, I was so um, surprised to find that there were so many examples of rugs in that book of animals that were done in a primitive cut, done in an eight, nine, um, because that is my, my sort of sweet spot. And I just didn't think she did that. I didn't think she had that in her sort of um, goodie bag of, of treasures and techniques, but she has everything. She had everything. So I'm sure that she will be sorely missed by so, so many people, not just obviously her family and friends, but in a larger circle of rug hookers who loved her, who followed her, who thought about her, who deferred to her. Uh, and I'm sure we'll all certainly think about Judy whenever we're hooking any animal, right? Any animal at all. That reminds me, this made me think of her. I mean, this is not, this is not Judy by any stretch of the imagination, but I hooked this for cocktail time the first cocktail time episode we did it's one of the Schmetz pets cats and I did the white whiskers you know this is all hooked in an eight and it's quite small but the cat drinking the wine and when I thought about it I thought I did a few of the things that Judy said to do um, I just don't hook in that style I'm not that good but I still really like it but I think the point is whenever we hook an animal in the future we're all going to be thinking about Judy right and whatever you can take out of this episode, out of that book, that helps you do whatever you're trying to do better, that's the thing, isn't it? Something that you want to do better. You don't have to do it Judy's way, do it your way. Um, but maybe Judy said something that I said tonight, or maybe there's something more in the book, there's a lot more in the book, that you can tap to figure out how you get to that spot that you want to be in next, because it's, it's going to be there. Let's see. Oh, you are so welcome. Great, I'm glad you enjoyed the show. Um, I wish I had more to say. I wish I knew her personally. The best I could do was, was to try to do justice to what is one of the greatest books in rug hooking, the rug hooking library for sure. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you all enjoyed it. It's so, it's so good to be here with you tonight. And, oh, Karen, it was. Karen, thanks for that great tip on that medium, the, um, what was it, folk, the folk art Americana, right? The medium. Fantastic. Wonderful book. So inspiring. Yep. It is so inspiring. I was so happy. Um, that I was able to get that book again fairly quickly. I wish I could have got it even quicker by finding it. But um, I really wanted to share that with you and to talk about her for this episode so that we will always think about her. We will always think about these iconic rug hookers who, who gave us something so, gave us a lot, but specific things. And my specific things about Judy will be different than yours. So 
Um, she goes on and on and on, you know, and, and we'll talk about her, I'm sure, many times in the future. But in the meantime, I hope to see you tomorrow at Whispering Hill if you're in this part of the country. I will be there tomorrow with my mom, um, right, right first thing at 10. And I hope to see you there. And otherwise, maybe I'll see you on Sunday night for the Maud Lewis Designing Like Maud Lewis class. That'll be our last in the series of this Maud Lewis class until our next artist next month. Um, otherwise, I will see you on Monday for coffee time at noon Eastern Standard Time. I will see you then. In the meantime, have a great weekend, everybody. I'm glad you're feeling inspired. Please like, share, subscribe, comment, do all those great things that help this show be seen and found by other people in other places so that they can enjoy it and learn from it and get the same things from it that, that we're sharing. They might as well since we're doing it anyway, right? Thank you 